Philadelphia, 55% of the city's elderly are either minority, foreign born, or both, and 43% are poor. And we use 200% as a cutoff because that's the more meaningful cutoff in terms of cost of housing, food, transportation, and things like that. And um, then we have a 60-40 gender split, which is about average for um, older adults. Now, given that there's incredible diversity among the older adult population itself in terms of age, income, health, ethnicity, whatever, what have you, and also significant diversity within the city's neighborhoods in terms of quality of housing, physical environment, crime, and all those kinds of issues, we were thinking about the best ways to serve that very diverse population and to create more hospitable, more hospitable physical and social environments for older adults to live in. Uh, just to give you a little bit of a background on where we work, uh, Philadelphia Corporation for Aging is the Area Agency on Aging for Philadelphia. Um, every county is served by what's called a AAA, and they're usually housed within county government. Um, however, PCA is a nonprofit, and we have about 750 employees, and we're funded by the federal government through the Older Americans Act and also by the state lottery. And so with this money, um, we contract out services to over 180 organizations in what's called the Aging Network. Um, these are all organizations that serve older adults, um, such as senior centers. And um, we also have a case management division, a housing department that provides home modifications, and we have a planning department where both Alan and I work. Uh, more than 100,000 people a year benefit from PCA-funded services. Uh, but because the needs of Philadelphia seniors exceed the funding available, we've sought ways to expand our reach, and this is where the age-friendly efforts come in. So like us, many communities are beginning to recognize the importance of thinking about traditional aging services in the context of the wider community. A uh, survey by UC Berkeley identified almost 300 such efforts in the city, I mean, excuse me, in the country, and many of these initiatives use guidelines established by organizations such as the EPA, um, AARP, the Visiting Nurses Service of New York, and also the World Health Organization. And just to note, the city of Philadelphia was just admitted to the uh, WHO's Global Network of Age-Friendly Cities about a month ago. And both Alan and I are in the subcommittee um, for the Mayor's Commission on Aging that's uh, doing the second requirement, which is a citywide assessment. But about our effort, um, Age-Friendly Philadelphia is um, based on the EPA framework, and it was initiated about three years ago to build on our work to help older adults remain in their neighborhoods for as long as possible. And the premise is that supportive neighborhood environments can create more opportunities for independence and healthy living by positively influencing people's lifestyles. So there are four key features um, of our effort. And the first is that it's a joint policy planning research approach. And I run the policy and planning portion of the agenda, and Alan runs the research piece. And you'll learn more about that through some of the examples that we'll be talking about soon. Um, the second is that we're catalyzing projects with organizations outside of aging. Uh, just to give you some background, I don't come from the field of aging. I have a master's in public administration, and I've run programs in city governments having to do with parks and economic development and public art. And it's interesting that most of the organizations that I worked with before, um, including myself, we were not talking about seniors. We were talking about the creative class and kids. And so um, in coming to PCA, and with that in mind, I've been trying to work with organizations outside of the aging field to um, help them to integrate seniors into their policies and plans and programs. And um, we've, we've really been trying not, we don't want to run programs. We would rather serve as a catalyst for new projects so that organizations can actually incorporate age-friendly work um, into their agendas. And we've been emphasizing with our partners the third point, um, what's good for seniors is good for people of all ages. Because a lot of the changes to the physical environment that will be beneficial to seniors are actually beneficial to kids and pregnant ladies and, you know, really everybody. And the last um, key feature of our effort is um, we've been inspiring emerging leaders to be the champions of our age-friendly projects. Um, and just to briefly touch on that point, that strategy um, to involve people in their 20s and 30s in age-friendly, um, as I mentioned, most professions are really not talking about aging, and we believe it's really important to educate the next generation of leaders in Philadelphia to incorporate the needs of older adults into their jobs in whatever profession they're in. 
Um, so Gen Philly is a, an award-winning network of over 300 emerging leaders from a variety of fields, including urban planning, who work with seniors in some way or another. And through social media, by monthly meetings, and public events, Gen Philly shows emerging leaders that there's a competitive professional advantage that results from incorporating knowledge about older, older adults into their skill set. And so we've been asking our members to think about the type of city in which they themselves want to grow old and to think about how they can get there while still helping the current population of seniors. Our members come from a wide range of places, but you'll see in um, those that have to do with urban planning, there are folks from um, SEPTA, which is our transportation authority, from an architecture firm, from CDCs, from the Mayor's Office of Sustainability, so a lot of, a lot of different types of organizations. Um, and we also have events, and um, we've held over 20 events that try to tap into popular culture. Um, and the topics have ranged from the arts to pets to women's images as we age. Um, but here are some that relate to urban planning, um, having to do with transportation, community gardening, uh, sustainability. And what we're trying to do is trying to break down existing stereotypes about working with seniors. Um, and we're trying to make this topic um, appealing and cool. So, Alan. We're going to just very quickly review those four points Kathy made of what the EPA Aging Initiative um, is about. And then we're going to talk about how we've applied it here. So the first one, social connectivity, and um, you know, having connections with your friends and neighbors, eating healthy, which means access to fresh fruits and vegetables at prices and in volume that's appropriate for older adults, accessible housing. And here we're talking about both access in terms of visibility, but also houses that are not falling apart around the older adults. And mobility, especially, excuse me, public transportation and um, other forms of transportation other than privately owned automobiles. Uh, as Kathy said, uh, this bring the model brings active aging together with smart growth. Active aging means that older adults take responsibility and are part of the process of helping maintain their own health and well-being. And smart growth, Kathy described, what we found especially appealing about the EPA model is that by bringing these, these two together, active aging and smart growth, it also brings together two vocabularies. Because sometimes the difficulty exists between planners and the aging community, and we kind of speak different languages, and this model brought those languages together. What we did was we took a uh, omnibus data from an omnibus health survey that's conducted in the area. We operationalized the four uh, elements in the EPA model. Social capital is measured by uh, feelings about neighbors and neighborhood, better housing by the amount of home repair that was needed, access to transportation, as reports that they, uh, older adults need transportation or couldn't get to a doctor because of lack of transportation, and access to healthy foods was measured by um, the quality of groceries in the, in the area. And we looked at how those four were associated with four health outcomes important to us, self-rated health, which is actually a wonderful measure of both morbidity and mortality, uh, number of depressive symptoms, being physically active, and the desire of the older adults to remain in their own home. We found out that not only are the EPA factors related to those outcomes, but even when controlling for the effect of poverty and minority status, the relationship is maintained, which means that interventions based on the EPA model can have positive health outcomes for all, all older adults. Um, now we're just going to give you some examples uh, from those four different principles of projects we're working on here in Philadelphia. Um, <clears throat> the first having to do with parks, the second community gardens, the third the zoning code, and the fourth transportation. So the EPA um, principle number one, social connectivity. Um, as you all are aware, um, city parks can provide seniors with the opportunity for social interaction, relaxation, and both passive and active exercise. Oh, we just got kicked off, guys. Keep going. OK. Um, they can also serve as venues to build intergenerational cohesion within neighborhoods. So despite Philadelphia's uh, wealth of open public space, seniors are underutilizing parks. In um, 2010, um, I'm wondering if other people are kicked off, too. Okay, I'll keep going. So um, in 2010, 72% of older adults in the city reported not um, having attended a public recreation facility, including a park, in the past year, 
Well, just 1% said that there was no uh, public recreation facility near their home. Um, so in the summer of 2010, I got together with a Gen Philly member from the Fairmount Park Conservancy, which is a nonprofit that fundraises for the parks, uh, Philadelphia Parks and Recreation, uh, to look at how we could encourage seniors to use parks more. We jointly created an age-friendly parks checklist, um, which details the features in a park that we thought would um, encourage usage by seniors. And our, the checklist is available on our website. Um, and examples from the list include creating more shaded areas, adding railings and stairway, along stairways, and ensuring that sidewalks are both wide enough for wheelchair and uh, firm enough so that it doesn't sink into the dirt. The next step um, was then to show this to seniors to see what they think. Um, we did this as focus groups, and Alan's going to talk about that in a sec. Um, but since fine-tuning the list with the seniors, we've been um, using it to identify signature age-friendly parks to market to seniors. Um, we've been working with a class at UPenn in urban planning, and we will be also working with um, an OT uh, class at University of the Sciences also for students to take a look at these parks, see what they think. Um, and also our partners at the Horticulture Society will be using the list for some future capital improvements. Um, and we hope that it's used when new parks are built. And in the future, the Fairmount Park Conservancy will be seeking funding to create programming for seniors um, in these signature age-friendly parks like Tai Chi and yoga. So Alan, do you want to talk about uh, the research portion? Yeah, I'm going to describe how, how research has supported this uh, parks effort. I also want to uh, use it as an opportunity to illustrate how different research methods get used in order to focus on one particular uh, goal. So one thing we use is statistics, and you can see 72% of older Philadelphians um, report not using public recreation facilities. So there we've defined the problem. Then we go into GIS, we go into mapping, we look at the relation of where parks are to older adults who have a functional impairment that interferes with um, living independently. We call them IADL impairments. And you can see that areas that have very high rates of people with older adult, uh, of older adults with IEDL impairments are also close to parks, creates an opportunity. If we do something about the parks, then perhaps you know, more of those adults would enjoy them. And finally, we use qualitative methods in order to figure out how to solve the problem. We did focus groups at senior housing and senior centers, and we showed them the proposed um, uh, parks checklist, asked them what they wanted most. And what they told us universally was the two things they want most are safety and safety it can be defined either in terms of who else is in the park or concerns about bikes and, and, and automobiles moving through the park and bathroom. And we also learned that they would prefer to go into parks in groups for a number of reasons. And those kinds of lessons then get turned back into a uh, uh, policy initiative. On the second EPA principle, eating healthy. Um, here's an alarming statistic. 65% uh, of older Philadelphians report being obese or overweight. Um, there are a number of efforts citywide to increase access to fresh foods in the city, uh, especially in food deserts, and PCA is pitching in by encouraging community vegetable gardens at senior centers and senior housing complexes. Uh, in February 2011, Jem Philly led a groundbreaking event at City Hall called Germinating Partnerships, connecting seniors to community gardens, um, which aim to bring together aging network organizations and groups that work with community gardens. And through the event, we created an online toolkit to promote gardens at senior centers, which is on our Gentilly um, website. And then we also um, created a listserv uh, to connect, um, connect folks around the issue. And if you're interested in becoming a part of that listserv, definitely let me know. Um, but after the event, the Secretary of Aging uh, stated that he would like to have a garden at each senior center in Pennsylvania, which is super exciting. And we also uh, worked with the EPA on a fact sheet that instructs communities on how to create um, elder-friendly gardens. And it was actually with the Brownfields Initiative at the EPA. And here is um, what the fact sheet looks like and, and the link as well. It's a wonderful, wonderful uh, resource. And then also a great uh, research project came out of the Gen Philly event, which Alan is going to talk about. Again, we used multiple methods here. We did some statistics, which Kate has already shared. We looked at where uh, older adults report the uh, greatest difficulty in accessing fresh fruits and vegetables. It overlaps where there's greatest poverty. And we were asked by some of these uh, sites that run gardens to do an evaluation of them, both senior housing and senior, um, uh, senior centers. 
And what we did was we brought in a researcher who did senior and garden evaluation, again using a focus group technique, to ask <clears throat> not so much what benefit you know, the elder is getting from the goals we had, which was, you know, eating more fresh fruits and vegetables, being physically active. But what the older adults themselves thought were the reasons they wanted to garden, because that's going to make the difference in terms of whether these programs are successful. And interestingly enough, the number one goal, the number one um, reason older adults reported liking gardening was an emotional or mental health benefit. The idea makes it calm, relaxing, they don't think about anything else. Uh, they got a lot of pleasure out of eating the products that they had owned, that they had grown. You, even acid pain didn't seem to go away when they were lost in the garden. Um, they also mentioned continuing tradition. Many of these older adults had gardened before as children. Responsibility. This is a very important one. Many older adults say that they're loved, but they're not respected. And here's something where the older adult may be the expert, the teacher, the mentor. has a lot of meaning for them. Beauty, um, aesthetics have a lot of meaning for older adults. They want neighborhoods, they want things that look beautiful, and gardens certainly help with that. They build social connection, learning something new, and finally being a help to other, other uh, older adults. And those, those are listed in the order uh, that they appeared. So mental and emotional health appeared most often as a reason. Now I'm going to move on to the third principle, which is accessible housing. 68% of senior homeowners report remain, they desire to remain in their homes for at least 10 years. And by the way, that's mostly related to how they feel about their neighbors, not about the house or themselves. But there are two big challenges. One has to do with um, uh, physical frailty. You can see almost a quarter have uh, to use some device in the home. And almost 40% uh, say it's difficult to cover housing costs. And as far as the frailty goes, if you look at the picture, you can, I mean, for some it's going to be difficult to work to the third or fourth floor of that building, which means they may not know when a roof is beginning to have problems, and they may not have the funds to fix the home. Again, this is where residents report high need for home repair, and if you know the city, the areas with the highest need for home repair are also among the poorest in the city. So by identifying both uh, income and frailty and the interaction between the two as two particular needs, um, Kate started a policy intervention. Yeah, so in 2008, Philadelphia began the process of modernizing the zoning code for the first time in 40 years. And at that time, we did a search to the old code, and um, the words aging, elder, and senior citizens and were not mentioned in the code at all. So we worked with the head of Temple University's regional planning program, uh, Deborah Howe, and the Philadelphia Association of Community Development Corporation to identify ways to incorporate aging and community into the code. Um, the first uh, was through accessory dwelling units, or granny flats, or mother-in-law suites, as they're sometimes called. Um, ADUs are subordinate additional residences that are constructed within a residential property or a garage, uh, for example, on the first floor of a row home. And they can benefit seniors by providing the opportunity to downsize um, and live in the same building, um, but stay in the same community. And they can also um, have caregivers above them. They can make some money renting it out above them, um, and so forth. And some Philadelphians have actually built these illegally, which poses a great deal, a great challenge for emergency personnel who can't identify the units. So we were wanting to get these into the code. Um, PCA also worked with the Zoning Code Commission to include requirements for at least some new private housing to be visitable. Um, I know Kathy had defined it earlier. Um, but when a, when a home is visible, it's a place where people of all ages and abilities can enter, circulate, and enjoy. And it you know, features the zero-step entrance, which is super important in Philadelphia because um, most of our homes are row homes and they feature front steps, um, the half bath and all the hallways and doorways being wide enough. And just like I was saying before, what's good for seniors is good for people of all ages. Um, these features are really important because um, in, because they're, they're, super, they're also really important to people with you know, kids, for bicyclists, if you know you're going to the airport and you have your, you know, luggage and so forth, people with temporary disabilities if you broke a leg. Um, and so yeah, so in, in December 2011, the code was passed um, with limited provisions for these features, um, but we're really happy that the vocabulary was introduced and incorporated into the new code. Where's the next? Okay, we're going to move on to the next um, feature, which is transportation. We've got a 
Well, we're having a little trouble moving to our next slide. Not quite sure why. Well, in any case, let's see what. We're having trouble moving. Um, oh, here we go. Okay. All right. Here's the next one. Okay. Here we move from just using GIS and using um, uh, uh, statistics separately, but integrating the two. 50% of the city's low-income elderly do not live in a home with an automobile. So we look, and you can see in this map, we map where people report canceling a doctor's appointment due to transportation problem in relation to hospitals. We realize most people do not use hospitals for their primary care. It's not where their primary care physician is. But many older adults use specialists. They go into tests. So hospital location is important. When we look at this map, two things struck us. One was that there are a lot of people living in areas far away from hospitals that don't report a high rate of canceling doctor's appointments. And two, there are areas where there are high rates of canceling that are right near hospitals. We know those areas also seem to have a lot of um, low-income elders. So using the GIS, the, the maps we created, we developed a hypothesis that poverty rather than distance to hospital is the major predictor of canceling MD appointments. We then integrated data that we had taken from GIS, the location of hospitals, with data from the Omnibus Health Survey, canceling physician appointments, self-rated health and income, and indeed we confirmed our hypothesis. Poverty rather than distance to hospital is the major predictor of canceling a physician appointment. And we also found that health self-rated health, poverty rather than distance to hospital, is a major predictor of self-rated health. So by putting those pieces together, we were able to understand that, again, frailty and poverty together create the challenge. So these Age Friendly Philadelphia, we're not just uh, trying to create new initiatives, but we're also, we also want to highlight existing efforts to increase knowledge about services that help seniors, and transportation is a great example. Um, here is a chart that was created with one of our Gen Philly members from SEPTA, our Transportation Authority, um, for an event that we held at our Metropolitan Planning Organization, the Delaware Valley Regional Planning Commission, um, about, about um, innovation around transportation for seniors. And so, for example, um, you'll see from the chart in, in Philadelphia, we are super lucky that um, seniors have the benefit of riding bus, trolley, and subway lines for free and regional rail for just $1. So we're really trying to get the word out about this and trying to get seniors to sign up. Um, another example, you'll see um, bus stops. Um, all bus stops in Philadelphia are the responsibility of the city, and their maintenance and upkeep are contracted out to a private vendor. And we've really um, tried to promote their efforts to get a new contract to create more bus shelters um, that are age-friendly, meaning that they have seating and lighting. Because if you know Philly, um, most of the stops are just a lone pole. Um, so that the, the new shelters would really benefit people of all ages, but they would, might make the most difference to people with mobility problems um, who might not be able to stand for long periods of time and who can be especially, vul um, especially vulnerable to foul weather. So moving forward, um, we've been looking at what other cities are doing and trying to see if they can inspire collaborations in Philadelphia. Um, one is pop-up intergenerational playgrounds. Um, England's been creating a lot of playgrounds for seniors. And so inspired by this, we've been working with a group called Play In Between that has made a pop-up temporary play space on the Ben Franklin Parkway. And we've been working with them to see if we can create a um, pop-up playground in South Philly that would be good for people of all ages and abilities. Uh, another one is Senior Snow Corps. We've been working with the uh, Mayor's Office of Civic Engagement on an effort to catalyze civic and other local neighborhood-based organizations to get younger folks to help seniors to shovel their walks. And so far we've talked with Pittsburgh and Chicago that have really successful programs. Another has to do with uh, calming traffic around senior centers. I know New York City has done a lot of work with this, so we're in the beginnings of conversations with our city about it. And then Safe Routes to Schools. Um, We've been talking with a group in Atlanta, um, their regional commission. Um, they have a pilot program called Grandparents for Safe Routes to Schools. So we've been trying to learn more about that and see if we can get a program like that um, going on in Philadelphia. And so next steps for research. 
Well, three. One is we want a better integration of GIS and statistics. Um, there are interfaces, but we're looking at uh, uh, becoming more adept at moving between, between the two and integrating the two. We've been looking at new community needs assessments, which are different than clinical assessments, which are on the individual, and, although, and health impact assessments, because I think these are more surveying older adults and um, just looking at their current needs. And finally, we have a grant from the National Institute of Health called the Wish Kate named it the Walkability to Impact on Senior Health. And we're looking at the impact of the environment on health behaviors, including eating fresh fruits and vegetables and being physically active. And we're also using that as a way of increasing our, um, our sophistication in both GIS and statistical analysis. And just here's our contact information if you're interested in um, continuing the conversation. And definitely check out our website, um, PCAH Friendly, and also uh, the Gen Philly website, genphilly.org. So thank you. Do you want to pass it on? All right, so I'm going to uh, pull up right now. The contact for today's speakers. Um, contact for today's speakers are right here shown on the screen. And right now I'm just going to get us some questions that were asked, that have been asked throughout the, uh, throughout the webcast. Uh, the first that I, well, the, yeah, the, the most recent question that I've received um, comes from Richard Kenya. Um, He's, he writes, it appears that the accessibility visibility standards integrated into codes is really building code related regulations and not zoning code related regulations. Is this correct? Mm. The only exception may be allowing accessory, accessory dwelling units as a permitted or conditional use in a zoning district and required okay. visibility parking space in zoning code. Alan? Uh. Is it on? Yeah. No, okay, great. Um, yeah, I'm. You know, I'm not an expert at all in building codes or zoning codes. I'm just trying. To, I was just trying to facilitate it um, here in Philadelphia. Um, but it actually was included in our code. And if you want to check it out, if you go on um, zoningmatters.org, you can look at our um, newly adopted code, and you can see. Um, in terms of visitability, um, there is a section that says that in any subdivision containing 50 or more detached, semi-detached, or attached houses, at least 10% of the houses shall be visitable dwelling units. Um, and then in terms of accessory dwelling units, there's a whole big portion as well. However, um, it was actually, I believe it was an unresolved issue still, so it's in the code, but it, there isn't a defined area where you can actually, a permitted area where you can use them. Kathy, oh. did you have anything else you wanted to add about building yeah, code versus zoning? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Can I? Is the phone passed? Is the phone passed to me? Can you hear me? Yep, we can hear you. Let's see. Okay. Sorry, I was going to say. I, I, I think the, the the questioner was absolutely right. I mean, the uh, th those are dealing with building codes, and I would say that I, I think the the goal going back to the seat belt analysis, you know, 10% is it really isn't appropriate when we know that about 60% during the course of the house are going to need uh, to, a person living in the house is going to need to have that ex uh, visitability uh, key. And obviously it deals with people visiting the home too, which uh, you know may or may not have a disability. So yes, uh, it is dealing with the building code. And I think when there are almost restrictions of the wrong direction of um, only encouraging a subset, like only every other car or every 10% of the cars have seat belts, that wouldn't be the right thing to do. So. Yeah, the zoning probably is more directly with the accessory dwelling units and um, building code for the homes. But I think as planners, I think having sort of the big picture, um, the retrofitting is very expensive to do, at, uh, much more so than doing it up front, too. So um, I think uh, this gets back to the general goal of planners, you know, thinking ahead. Okay. Um, another question that came in, this is a sort of a technical question. Can we get... The web address um, for the first speaker for the document that you were referring to. Um, the first speaker that was uh, that 
was that Kathy or Kathy? Kathy or Price. with Ramona with Ray first? I don't know which one they're referring to. All right, all right. Um, yeah, if you can, um, if there's a document that was being referred to, uh, or if Robin Bancroft asked that question, Robin, if you'd like to be a, be a little more specific, um, following up, then we can ask that again. Uh, regarding Anne Shell asks, please explain what a pop up playground is. Okay. Um, well, there's an organization in Philadelphia called Play In Between, and Christine Piven is the director of it. And um, they created a temporary play space on the Ben Franklin Parkway with um, play equipment and furniture that could be like stored away overnight. Um, and you can check out the website and see what it looks like. And so just had met with um, Christine and, and we've also we've gotten other partners involved, um, two civic associations in South Philly, um, a landscape architecture art, um, landscape architect from an organization called um, Design for Generations, um, Jack Carmen. And we've all been having discussions about creating a space. There's a, um, a lot that's privately owned. Um, we, we've been thinking about working with the owner to create a space with um, play equipment or, I don't know, we're still like trying to figure it out, but play equipment that people of all ages would want to use. I think that a lot of grandparents go to um, playgrounds with their grandchildren and maybe would want to be physically active or active with them and not just, it wouldn't, wouldn't just be a play space just for seniors um, or just for kids, but for, for everybody. It's, we're still exploring it, but um, it sounds kind of like a neat idea. Okay. Um, Summer, Summer Sharp um, asks, how did these ideas apply to small towns, suburban locations, and more of the rural areas in the West? Uh, this is Kathy. I'm, I'm happy to say that we have, um, I think, the, the same goals that we have for, you know, uh, using unused land or uh, vacant lots in urban areas um, and, and concentrating um, new development where the center of towns are. In rural areas, there still are gathering places and still having the town center be where people come in to you know, do many of their errands um, is still the idea of how we um, organize things in rural areas. And I think um, the needs are the same, whether we're in urban, suburban, or, or uh, rural areas. Um, obviously, there's, there are some tools on our website that deal specifically with rural areas, but I think the issues are still the same about uh, um, the goals of our guidebook. And we have examples and winners from small and um, smaller uh, areas, um, communities, as well as uh, larger cities. So um, smart growth and active aging um, is important. Uh, uh, throughout the country, um, and um, and there can be things that can be done uh, from a, um, a development standpoint and or uh, program organizing, even in uh, rural settings. Okay, sounds good. Um, Gregory Perkins asks: Is it interesting that EPA is involved in aging? Uh, many people think that environmental just means natural resources. Oh, he says, I'm sorry, it is, he says interesting that EPA is involved in aging. Many people think that environmental just means natural resources. HUD and HHS both have aging services as well? Do HUD and HHS I mean, both have aging services as well? Right. Um, I'll be happy to, you know, say that um, many people don't know the mission of EPA is uh, first to to safeguard public health as well as the environment. So our mission is to protect public health. Almost, and we are a regulatory agency, although everything we've pretty much spoken of today are all volunteer um, examples of things because the decision makers are at the local level. Um, but as an agency, we do set standards um, for clean air and safe drinking water and so forth. Um, you know, for all people, and it, it addresses environmental needs. Um, you probably are familiar with environmental impact assessments uh, that were um, required after NEPA was passed, uh, you know, like 40 years ago. But also, um, there's been a, a movement now on health impact assessments um, that um, CDC and uh, people in England have actually been leaders on that really say that how we build can make a big difference on, on public health and, and uh, has been, I've seen some wonderful presentations by Howie Frumkin and 
Andy Dannenberg from CDC that have shown how the obesity rates have grown. If you can imagine a, uh, a map of the United States in light yellow turning darker and darker red as obesity rates increase. And the obesity problem is not just a children's issue, it's uh, all ages. And part of it, I would say, is definitely um, how we've designed our communities. So thinking about health as we plan great places to be, you know, pop-up play places or great gardens, um, you know, it's good for the soul, it's good for our health, and uh, probably good for the environment. So that's why we're involved. Uh, Chris, it's Ramona. I can talk a little bit about HUD. Um, you know, with the Partnership for Sustainable Communities effort that's going on between DOE, TO, DOT, HUD, and USDA and other agencies, there's been more of a focus on being able to broaden HUD's uh, perspective or um, in regards to its impact on seniors. As you know, it does have senior housing as um, part of its responsibility for low-income senior housing, but there's also efforts not only through research but also through interagency partnerships and just streamlining programs to be able to expand on what's already there in HUD and be able to create a much more um, supportive environment, um, especially um, with the onslaught of an aging population. So I mean, I, th I think um, I think Kathy and I both agree that um, EPA has been a very strong lead, especially as it has to relate to smart um, growth uh, and it, and those efforts in terms of the federal government. And uh, I like to think that the other agencies are catching up. I mean, we do know that CDC has been really involved. So I mean, I think uh, more and more of the federal agencies are coming on board with much more stronger programs. Uh, the next question that was posed in Q, um, what does ADL impairment mean? Or I, I think this is I, IADL impairment mean. Um, <clears throat> when we study uh, impairments among older adults, we usually split them as functional impairments into two groups, and activities of daily living, which are very basic. Can you eat yourself? Can you bathe yourself? Can you dress yourself? And IADLs, which are instrumental activities of daily living, can you prepare a meal, can you go shopping for yourself, that is to what extent can you live independently. Those criteria are often used both for setting um, uh, eligibility requirements for, um, uh, for programs and services, they also are very related to health outcomes. And what we found is that environmental change, if people already have some of these impairments, we make the environment more accessible to them, they're less likely to decline. The decline is more gradual, it takes more time. The more less accessible the environment, uh, the greater the decline in uh, both ADL and IADL impairments. And if I could just chime in, um, Alan said it very eloquently, but I'd also say if you think of yourself as a planner as trying to make it be, you know that commercial about pushing the easy button? If we made, if we integrated back into our daily lifestyle, you know, walking to the corner grocery store, that there is a corner grocery store and we're not in a place that's a food desert, um, that there are options of getting around because this, there are sidewalks, for example, or that there's a safe place to cross the street. You know, if it just makes it easier to do the things um, that keep us active and physically engaged and socially active, um, it can improve health. So this is, your job is sort of to think about, you know, making it push the easy button in your community by design. Okay. I want to say one other thing about um, ADL, IADL impairments. People with those kinds of impairments often don't get counted in surveys, depending on the way the survey is done. Uh, ADL impairment, like poverty, uh, can be barriers. Um, why social media are often not the best way to get to older adults. Fifty percent of Philadelphia's elderly do not use the do not use the internet, and they're disproportionately low income. And so, in terms of involving elders in these processes, you really need to think about the best way to do it and recognize that people with impairments, uh, people of low income, are not necessarily uh, adept at some of the data collection methods like using the internet or things like that that may be more effective in smaller popul in younger populations and, and wealthier populations. 
<laughs> okay. Um, I'm just going to ask the next one. Uh, what was the name of Holly, Holly Metal? Asks, what was the name of the SRTS aging program in Atlanta? Oh, um, the safe routes for schools? Is that what we're talking about? That's, yeah, that safe yeah. routes to schools. Okay. Um, yeah. Yeah. Okay, um, that's um, Mapleton. They actually just won um, the EPA award this year. Um, I know Kathy can talk a little bit more about that. Yeah, I mean, it, I think they were talking about the safe routes uh, for grandparents, grandparents to school. Is that what you were talking about, too? Yeah. Well, they, their AARP has been encouraging um, folks uh, to be involved, uh, getting the grandkids to walk to school, again, getting people out of cars. I don't know if you've ever seen at conferences when people raise their hands. I'm a boomer myself. Um, I think Kate's a little bit younger, and Alan, I'm not sure if you're a boomer, but we might be a boomers. But you know, when we were kids, we all walked to school. But my brother's kids, and uh, you know, the generations later, almost all, um, they moved the schools out to the you know the suburbs, and uh, the only way to get to school was by bus. So this is sort of a, a movement to encourage physical activity for all generations by having safe routes for seniors. There's also uh, seniors or grandparents uh, helping walk kids to school. So Mableton was one of those places. And I'll just, um, I'll just quickly say, too, that one of the barriers to having elders use public transportation had to do with people never having used it before, to somehow think that they're magically going to mm -hmm. use it. So Atlanta Regional Commission did a wonderful job by actually having elders show their peers how to use, how to read a bus schedule, how to read the metro or bus line um, or train system so, and go with them. They found that was the cheapest thing to do was just to show them, you know, have them go uh, with a, a volunteer one time to use the system. Um, so I think that uh, you can think of that in terms even for younger generations so people know how to get around um, and also that that's one of the options that they have. Okay. Uh, Patrick Nearing asks, uh, you mentioned the importance of corner, of corner grocery stores. Do you have any suggestions on how to encourage them or make them financially viable? Good question. I have a different little story, but um, I think, you know, the SNAP program, I guess, is uh, what the USDA, the former food stamps program is that helps low-income seniors get uh, access to fresh foods. I think it's, you know, it's one of these things we're encouraging, you know, the, the, um, the big places, the big warehouses sort of compete on price, but, you know, if someone doesn't have access to a car, that corner grocery store is really key. Um, local food markets are popping up, and I can tell you an example. I know this is a big city one, but again, I think there's one in Charlottesville, Virginia as well. New York City um, had buses at schools that were idling during the day. They weren't transporting kids to food from their homes, um, and there were seniors in high-rises uh, that had sort of aged in place, you know, so it wasn't a senior housing place when it started, but that's where people just continued to live, and it became a senior housing place, and they had uh, no access by transportation to get to a local farmer's market that was in a building, so they literally had the school buses in New York work it out where they actually transport elders during the day to pick up food, so the farmers benefited, the healthy foods that elders got benefited. So I kind of say if there's a will, there's a way. I mean, if there's a critical mass of folks, I mean, the Beacon Hill models that are happening in Boston and other places are just people saying, we've got to fix this problem. So identifying problems or, you know, if you can use the GIS map to find, uh, you know, where there's food deserts and, you know, talk to neighborhood um, businesses to say, you know, this neighborhood can really support um, a, a grocery store that would be really helpful to feed this uh, demographic group here of all ages that, uh, you know, it has to get on a bus and, and go for 10 miles to uh, get to their closest grocery store that sells fresh fruits and vegetables. It's really critical. I think we should be thinking about that, again, as a systems approach and uh, um, as much as we can as advocates for health and well-being. And again, I think the planners are in a key role there is to say, hey, we shouldn't be building out here. There's nothing. There's no infrastructure here. We should be going and reusing and redoing the homes here that are near where there's a whole bunch of uh, resources. I don't know if that answers your question.
Oh, you know what? I just asked uh, a question. And I just realized that my uh, audio was on mute. So I'm going to go again. Um, tools to really get serious. It's uh, tools to really get seniors to participate. Are focus groups the best method? And are they are they into social media? Is social media a viable outlet of uh, senior participation? Social media among uh, use among older adults, as I said before, is very class-based. Um, and we can tell that because uh, many Philadelphia seniors have a cell phone, but they do not have access to a computer. They're not using um, low-income elders. They're not using Facebook. They're not using a lot of the traditional kind of social media outlets. So surveys that are done in that way disproportionately collect information from healthier and wealthier older adults who are um, often uh, the uh, more politically active also so that their interests get represented sometimes over the interests of the very frail um, and, and the very poor. And that's a classic problem. Focus groups and senior centers are giving people a time, opportunity to speak and other methods to gather information from frail, low-income, non-English speaking um, elders are critical. They're time intensive. They're a lot of work. But without that, you just get um, uh, just a piece of it. And part of the problem is, and I don't mean to criticize anybody, that the, the boomer image is, is an image that only applies to a portion of the current older generation, you know, the wealthy, educated, you know, outspoken, whatever else comes with, with boomer. Uh, Philadelphia, for example, has the public and parochial high schools that had the largest number of graduates die in Vietnam. Those were not the boomers. And so in that very diverse older population, we have to be sure that we're touching all the constituencies and not to ones that are most educated, most vocal, or most sophisticated in, in making their wishes known. And all I'll right. just quickly say, too, if I can, just really quickly, just saying that, you know, um, I think going to groups that uh, work with older adults, like the National Association of Area Agencies on Aging, the Coalition of Wisconsin Aging Groups, senior centers in your community, they are folks that can help get uh, feedback for, um, you know, what they'd like uh, planners to help um, make their community a better place to live for all ages. All right, I'm going to ask the, the next question. Tips on interface between Gen Philly age groups and seniors. Um, well, actually, Gen Philly's target audience is emerging, are the emerging leaders in Philadelphia, um, people primarily in their 20s and 30s. So it's more of a professional development um, tool, the group is. Um, so I'm not sure. In terms of um, getting younger people to connect with older people, um, one of the one of the things that I've I've heard from some of the Gen Philly folks is that um, I don't know if you all are familiar with like the DIY movement, the do it yourself. You know, like everybody's canning and you know sewing and doing community gardening. And um, one of the things that we've we've talked about often is that the old older folks in our community are the original DIYers. You know, they um, were doing victory gardens and canning tomatoes and so forth back in the day. So trying to find those common, um, you know, common threads to bring groups together, I think, could be a good a good way to, to do so. Alan, did you have any other thoughts? Yeah, I think anything that creates the opportunity where older adults and younger adults are being collaborative and cooperative rather than one doing something for the other. So that, and Jen Philly's created a lot of those opportunities by getting members to think about these things, getting members to think about how they can involve older adults in their work, by making them aware of the different kinds of interest and expertise that exist in the older adult population. And that becomes very important because otherwise intergenerational becomes photo ops and not much more. So it's creating those moments where there really is a common interest, like in gardening or in something like that, and then giving them the opportunity to work together on it. The other thing we've learned from that, by the way, <clears throat> is when that happens intergenerationally, say in a senior center or senior housing, it increases trust between the older adult and the sometimes the social worker who may be 60 years younger of a different race and education. And once that trust is built, um, uh, once that trust is built, then other kinds of reliable information can be passed. 
Older adults get an enormous amount of unreliable information. Uh, that's how they wind up uh, losing their homes. That's how they wind up spending money on worthless health care or health care schemes. 50-plus, uh, by the way, is the fastest growing group for new HIV infections because there's so little knowledge about um, how to avoid HIV infection in this age group. So building those trust relationships can be critical. All right, I'm going to ask uh, one last question for the uh, for the afternoon, um, and then we'll wrap up by uh, giving um, CM information as well as, uh, you know, my final thanks to you all. Uh, to everyone, what do you suggest is the best way for a community to get started using the EPA model? Who needs to take the lead and be brought to the table? This is Kathy. I'll try it. I definitely want to have uh, Kate uh, weigh in after this, too, because of the wonderful groups that you bring together. I mean, I really think every neighborhood is going to be different, but finding the people who are community leaders, and they can be from NGOs, they can be from the business sector, they can be from local government. Your local government, uh, you know, the planning office can take the lead. You, uh, We've had partners, as I mentioned, with the uh, the people who took the lead in different communities came from all different offices within county governments or within local governments. Um, so I think it's finding, you know, the critical mass. So usually it has to be some, uh, you know, uh, synergistic person, or I should say some uh, person who's the catalyst, I'm sorry, the, the, the leader who kind of, you know, stirs up trouble uh, in a good way, meaning getting people together, focusing on, on what changes uh, need to happen to make uh, the, the local community a, a better place to live uh, throughout life. But uh, I defer to um, Kate, but I will say anybody who would like a copy of the resource, Ramona, I'll, I'll, we can mail them out, uh, Growing Smarter, Living Healthier. So you can look at what we prepared through the eyes uh, for an elder to get involved. But this is the same way, the reverse way of how a planner could get involved, too. Um, I would echo what Kathy said about getting a diverse group of people around the table. Definitely somebody from the area agents in aging for your uh, county and folks from you know who are who are involved with urban planning. Um, one of the things is that we really did was look to see what were existing opportunities. So what was already happening? Like the zoning code was happening. Um, you know, there's been so much work on with parks here. So, I mean, things that are already going on and trying to capitalize on, on those types of things and trying to integrate older adults into those programs instead of just reinventing the wheel and asking um, your partners to start up new programs, see what's actually going on. Um, and maybe taking those four different um, principles and <coughs> dividing it out and trying to see and look for opportunities within each one. and start making lots of appointments for meetings. It's like all about all about meeting people. Al, did you have any um No, I think that that that's it. You, you know, you the one of the things we really like about the EPA framework is it is a framework and you can take different opportunities yeah. for those different areas. Not everybody's gonna have visitability as a priority as we do, partly because as Kate said, visitability was already something being discussed here. So seeing it as a framework rather than a rigid set of rules really provides opportunities for, for, for creativity and, you know, and approaching it uh, in, in whatever way is most appropriate for the local environment. All right. Well, uh, thank you, Alan, for, uh, that, final, for that final thought. Uh, just some other final thoughts. Uh, when, I, uh, when we close out the webinar, um, you're going to get an evaluation form. Feel free to ask any questions that you didn't get a chance to, uh, to pose um, within that evaluation. Um, you could also, uh, also the, uh, the PowerPoint presentations which were presented today will be available sometime next week, early next week for your viewing. Uh, so with that said, uh, I would just like to go over uh, just a few housekeeping items. To log on DM credits, uh, go to planning.org, set select activities by date, once again, this is the Aging Friendly Act Agenda. Today is March 16th. And you can find this archived at the Utah site under webcasts and archive. So with that said, uh, I'd just like to thank my speakers, thank our presenters once again, um, Kathy, uh, Kathy, Alan, Ramona, and Kate, uh, for uh, giving a wonderful presentation today. And I'd like to thank all of you for uh, sitting with us today while we went through some technical difficulties. So. With that said, um, I'd like to thank you all and have a nice afternoon.
Thanks, Chris. Thank you. Yeah, I'm ending uh, ending up now. Yeah, take care. Take care.